Uh, welcome back to the first lecture on live rehearsal. We're going to talk about how simulation is used as a form of live rehearsal. How people go out and practice their jobs again and again before they actually get their hands on a real weapon or a real tractor or a real aircraft carrier and learn to do it right before they're fighting for their lives. Uh, this goes back as far as the Roman gladiators. The gladiators were essentially pr practicing live rehearsal. They got into the arena and fought with each other, usually not to the death, but until somebody had the clear advantage and he became the winner. And they did this day after day and usually spared the lives of the losers because they had to come back the next day. It's like the NFL. If you killed the losing team on the NFL every Sunday, it wouldn't be very many Sundays before you were out of teams. And so they were wanting to get a good show. They wanted experienced gladiators down in their arenas down there. And so the good ones got to live and fight again. And they got to be very good. And Spartacus proved that they were very good in 73 BC. He led the gladiators in a revolt against Rome. And for three years, he successfully held his own against the Roman armies until they finally put him down. But for three years, he was showing them that the gladiators were great warriors, that they could stand their own against the Roman soldiers, and they did. So that's the beginning of live rehearsal, or the beginning where I can show you a picture of it. The same kind of thing has been going on for eons. If you pick up the book, uh, The Harper's Encyclopedia of Military History, you'll find a huge amount of information on the history of the military, and you can pick out some nuggets about how training emerged over the centuries. Training wasn't always natural. There was a time when the military just showed up and they did whatever they were able to do to defend their cities, their homes, whatever. There was no training. As we got more and more organized armies, we started to learn that if you trained people to do something, that you had much better control over them. And when you went out into a battle, they reacted with much more organization and they behaved much more disciplined. And then as we evolved more complex weapons, we found out that people off the street couldn't necessarily operate these weapons effectively. So the military had to train people to operate new weapons like the crossbow, things that just didn't come natural or things that they didn't own in their own homes. And then you started to find out that a soldier who's trained is not only better with his weapon, but a smaller force is more effective against a larger force. We learned the idea of a force multiplier. We learned that trained soldiers were worth more than untrained soldiers, regardless of the size of their muscles or how tall they were or how much weight they could lug around. They, if they were more skilled, they were more effective. And so the price of training was being paid back when you got to battle and you got those same soldiers back to you after the battle rather than leaving them dead out there. And then we found out that we could execute more complex tactics. Some ideas that commanders had couldn't be executed by troops that weren't trained. There was no way that they, the troops could understand as an organization how to pull off a complex maneuver. But if you would practice with them, they would come to understand it and you could do tricky things around your enemy who was not trained and befuddle him and beat him because you had the opportunity to practice these tactics. Uh, here's a picture of infantry training in 1897. Uh, the training is as simple as getting these soldiers to lay down on their backs, prop the rifle against their knee, and use the elevated sight to shoot farther. It's a skill that they may not have learned on their own, or they may have learned the wrong way, learning from their fathers and, and their uncles and things on their own. But you simply take people out to a firing range and teach them to fire their, their weapon better. Here's a picture of a boot camp in 1917. In 1917, most of the soldiers and their weapons were at war. And we had a boot camp full of new trainees who needed to learn to use rifles, who needed to drill in groups. And we didn't have enough rifles to give them to learn to teach them how to handle their weapons. And so we handed them two by fours and a whittling knife and said, please whittle your rifle out of this two by four. And so these soldiers whitt whittled these devices, which they called shams, and they may go through all of boot camp practicing with that wooden rifle. And in some cases, the soldiers didn't have, didn't touch a real rifle until they got on the train on their way to France. 
Now those were extreme cases. But we were so short of weapons that we had to come up with some kind of simulation device for people to practice with their weapon. <clears throat> Another example of a, of a cannon. 1917, here's a team learning to operate a cannon or an artillery piece with one that's made out of wood. They're obviously not going to shoot shells very far. They're not going to practice the accuracy of the weapon. What they're learning is how to operate the breech mechanism, how to drop in that wooden round and slam it shut without slamming one of the guy's fingers in the breech, and what to call out when you need a certain kind of round, what to call out right before you pull the lanyard, what to do leading up to the actual firing of the weapon. There are a lot of skills that these three guys needed before they actually practiced hitting a target downrange. And this device could help them to do that. This is very, very important when you can't afford enough weapons to equip your army at war and to equip your trainees in boot camp. A group in 1940 with a wooden machine gun, they're out on an exercise in the field and these guys are learning to find good cover and concealment but still achieve a good field of fire with their machine gun. And a referee will walk around after they've emplaced this thing and judge them on how well they've picked their spot to see if they, can, they have overlapping fire with the next machine gun down the row, that kind of thing. 1941. We conducted the Louisiana maneuvers. We took our army into the swamps of Louisiana and Mississippi. And the armies practiced maneuvering about, practiced executing their commander's orders in a field. And we were trying to find out if our troops were skilled enough and ready enough to go to war. And they, the troops in the field essentially became chess pieces. We're really exercising the tactics coming out of the minds and the voices of the commanders and being given to the people on the field. They were to march this way and march that way to get down now, to get up to now. And people were um, playing out another game on paper, deciding where artillery rounds fell or where machine gun fire cut people down. And the referees would run around on the field and judge people dead based on what was happening in another realm on a paper battlefield. Now that wasn't very useful for the troops in the field. They're getting dirty and they're getting used to the weight of their packs and the weight of their weapons, but they really didn't know what was going on. And when they were dead, they were like, well, what was I supposed to do about it? Well, nothing. You're kind of the chess piece. Just, just march where we tell you to march. Here's a gunner, gunnery training device that the Navy developed. They went out and they mounted a, a uh, camera in an aircraft and they followed another airplane around as it flew around, as it flew evasive maneuvers. And then they took it back to the lab and they painted a bullseye on each frame of the film. And the bullseye represents where a naval anti-aircraft gun should be aimed to hit this aircraft in this maneuver. The training exercise is then to sit in the classroom, watch the film, and for the guy with the machine gun to keep his sight trained on the bullseye painted on each frame of the film. He's learning eye-hand coordination and he's also teaching his brain when you see an airplane like this, you put the sights right here. I showed this in the Netherlands when I taught this class and a guy said, we still use that exact same idea to teach people how to aim a Stinger missile system. So that same idea is still being used today. A picture from the National Training Center. In the National Training Center, before they go out and conduct their live exercise in the deserts of California, one of the things that they do is get out some shovels and dig up a dirt map here that represents the hills and valleys that they're going to be fighting on. And the commander will sit down and explain to his forces and his subordinates what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to rendezvous, when they're supposed to reach certain points, when they're going to open fire, when they're trying to be stealthy, when it's okay to be exposed. And he'll explain that to them around this battlefield map. And then he'll ask them to repeat it back to the, him and to replay it back for him so he can say, that's right, that's right. Joe, you, you weren't listening. Wake up. You were supposed to be here. Or your rendezvous point was here. Or your time on target was this. And they get this rehearsal around this dirt map before they go out and execute the next level of live training. So this is kind of like training within training or simulation within simulation. I'm going to introduce you to the National Training Center. Some of you may have already been there. But the National Training Center is probably the best 
live training facility in the world. You can take up to 2,000 different um, vehicles out on the battlefield and have them participate in a simulated live rehearsal game. The soldiers go out there with real tanks, real trucks, real helicopters, real people, their tents, everything. They don't shoot live weapons at each other, but they practice maneuvering and shooting laser beams at each other. When they get out there, the first thing that they, has to be created for them is a visual enemy. The vehicles that we would normally field against them look just like the vehicles they operate every day. So the first step is to create visual modifications to the equipment. They, the red forces that we fight against take equipment and use uh, wood and steel to modify the way it looks so that when our soldiers see it coming over the hill, their eye says, that's not an M1 tank, that's a T-80 tank. That's not a Bradley, that's a BMP. So that they visually can react to, that's the enemy. Much better than doing something like painting the vehicles red or sticking a red flag out of the top or something that distinguishes red from blue. That's the first step, is making the enemy look like the enemy. The, the second step is fitting each piece of weaponry, a tank, a tow missile, or a rifle with a laser beam. And you fit it with this laser beam so that when you fire a blank round through that weapon, a laser beam is fired downrange. That laser beam in, impacts laser sensors that are strapped onto the soldiers or wrapped around the vehicles. And those laser sensors recognize who just shot them and what effect that should cause. Now if you look at the next slide, you'll see that when that laser beam hits a tank, the, there's enough information encoded in that laser beam so that the tank sensors and the little computer that's attached with it recognizes whether he's just been struck by another tank or by machine gun fire from an M16. And he knows not to disable himself, not to simulate his own death in response to M16 fire, but to do it in response to another tank firing on him or a tow missile firing on him. When these tanks recognize that, they, or soldiers, either one, recognize that they've been hit with a lethal shot, the computer simply shuts down their laser firing mechanism. It also sets off like a police light on top of the vehicle. You shut off the laser firing mechanism and the vehicle essentially becomes dead. He's still able to drive around. He still has control of the engine of his tank and the turret and everything. He can still move it. But he can fire all day long and there's not going to be another laser beam shoot out of there and he's going to be totally ineffective. So in some senses they've stopped him from cheating. They found other ways to cheat and we're building the Miles 2000 system to stop new, more sophisticated ways of cheating. The other thing that the, the simulation does is it sets off a, a light on the turret. Why would you do that? Because a live tank and a dead tank look exactly alike on the, at the National Training Center. There's no fire, there's no smoke, there's not a hole in it. And the only way you can tell which ones are alive and which ones are dead are that they have these little rotating lights. And so you know not to just keep shooting and shooting and shooting on the same dead, dead vehicle, wasting all your ammunition and time. That works great for direct fire weapons. A direct fire weapon is something where you aim and you take a bead on your target, pull the trigger and hit it. It doesn't work for indirect fire weapons. Artillery barrages, for example. When you throw artillery over the hill, there's no way to use a laser beam to kill somebody over there. Short of mounting huge mirrors on mountains or hanging them from an airplane or something, which is ridiculous.